May we pray. We thank you, Lord, for giving us yet another very beautiful morning. We want to call upon your presence, even as we uh, go through the book of Ruth as a group. Lord, we pray that you may inspire our thoughts, our minds, and our tongues, so that, Lord, the message of this book may continue to have a place in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, this is um, a very unique way of doing it. This is our first time. And so if we get teething problems here and there, we will be okay because, yes, there are teething problems. I just want to um, um, learn through a very quick um, historical context of the book of Ruth before we let the cast uh, pick up the book. Uh, Ruth is one of the only two books in the Bible named after women. That is Ruth and Esther. It is classified as one of the Jewish historical books. Its author is anonymous. We don't know the author. Although a lot of speculation here and there, the book has been associated at some point with Prophet Samuel. This, however, is not uh, um, very likely because Samuel is believed uh, to have died before David came to power. And we will see uh, how David comes into the scene of this particular book. In verse one of the book, it indicates that the events of the book happened years before it was recorded or it was written. The book itself, uh, towards the end, mentions King David. Since David came to power uh, at allowed 1010 BC, rather 1010 BC, this indicates that the book was written on or before that particular date. Um, sorry, not before, but on or after that particular date, since it mentions uh, David and so it brings in uh, the kingship of David. Um, the scene of the book, is both Bethlehem in Judah and also Moab, which was uh, east of the Dead Sea and about 30 to 40 miles away from Bethlehem. There was a very close uh, kind of uh, family relationship between the Israelites and the Moabites. The Moabites were the descendants of Lord's incestuous relationship with his daughters. Remember, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lord going to hide in the hills, the daughters and Lord thought that this is the end of the world and everybody else is dead. I mean, they thought nobody else existed in the world. And so, you know how the story went on and how the daughters got children with their father Lot. And so one of the daughters bore a son called Moab and who was the father of the Moabites. According to Genesis 11 and 27, Abraham's brother Haran was Lot's father. So uh, uh, I think uh, Abraham, Lot was a nephew kind of to Abraham. So you can see the cross relationship between the Moabites, the descendants of Moab, and the Israelites. The Moabites were also awarded land by God. And on their Exodus um, journey from Egypt, the Israelites were told by God not to wage war against their brothers, the Moabites. You can read that in the book of um, Deuteronomy, chapter 2, 
eight to nine. I can just blouse through that very fast. Um, Deuteronomy eight to nine says, Deuteronomy two, eight and nine says, so we went on past our brothers, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. We turn from the Araba Lord, which comes up from Erag and Ezon Geber, and traveled along the desert Lord of Moab. Then the Lord said to me, do not hurl us the Moabites or provo provoke them to war, for I will not give you any part of their land. I have given all to the descendants of Lot as a possession. So you can see this, um, the Moabites, as, uh, as much as the Israelites were promised or given the promised land, um, the Moabites had, even, had also their share of the promise. They were given their land and the children of Israel were told, those are your brothers, don't wage war against them. Don't take their land, I will not give them or give you their land. This, however, did not deter them from uh, being a constant thorn in the flesh of the Israel nation. All along the way, we, 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 we notice along the, the line of history, constant conflicts between the Moabites um, uh, and the Israel nation. Um, a note in, uh, or, or rather, a case in point is the assassination of King Egron of Moab by Ehud, who was an Israelite special agent. And we can read that story in chapter three of the book of Judges, 12 to 30. Actually, it reads like a modern day thriller, how this guy Ehud plotted to assassinate the, uh, the king um, of Moab. The Moabites were gross idolaters. Their gods included Chemosh and Baal Peor, whose worship included obscene rites and human sacrifice. So they were widely known for their idolatry. During David's reign, which was more close to the writing of the book uh, of Ruth, he made Moab uh, his vassals. He like annexed uh, the land of Moab. He made them his, his vassals and they paid tribute to him. During the line of King David, they, they paid uh, continuously tribute to him. This went on until the civil war in Israel which split them or split the two nations apart into two distinct nations. This was allowed 930 BC during the reign of King uh, Lehoboam. That is when the Moabites, after the split, that is when the Moabites took the opportunity, the weakness of the Israel nation, they took the opportunity to revolt. And now they no longer uh, paid um, they, they are, you know, they no longer paid uh, tribute to uh, King David or other to the nation of Israel. Noteworthy is that Numbers 25 somehow prohibits intermarriage uh, between Israelites and the Moabites. It's not very express, but it, is, it somehow prohibits that. We will not go into the reading of Numbers 25 but it's good to note that even as we go to uh, our reading for today. They are, however, um, uh, you see, uh, the Moabites are not mentioned in the seven tribes which the Israelites are expressly told by God do not intermarry with them. That is in Deuteronomy uh, chapter seven. In Deuteronomy seven, there are seven tribes where they are expressly instructed do not intermarry with them. But for the Moabites, there was kind of um, uh, an ish-ish, you know, a half uh, way of saying, yes, they are not very good people, but I don't, uh, you know, tell them expressly, do not intermarry with them. That gives us um, a background of understanding the
the relationship between the Moabites and the Israelites, even as we come now to the reading of the book of Ruth, which gives us, or rather which comes into the scene, uh, just like I have read it. With those few words, I just want to um, hand over to the cast so that we can continue with the reading of the book. Isaac, shall we begin? Yep. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, If Naomi looked like Trent, it's no wonder she remained unmarried. <laughs> hey, hang on. Uh, Sue, we're, we're not hearing you. I can't. <clears throat> now, shall we try again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed him, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even I, if I thought there were hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? Call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law who came back with her from the country of Moab. 
They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. Go, my daughter. Mm -hmm. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was in the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? She is a, a Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. Now listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to the people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord. God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers. And he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, Let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some of the handfuls for her from the bundles, and leave them for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She picked it up and came into town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Blessed be, blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. He even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. It is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women. Otherwise, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes 
and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to this man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. All that you tell me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of a heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. Who are you? I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good. Let him do it. If he is not willing to act as, as next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before one person could recognize another, for he said, It must not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said, Bring the cloak you were wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her back. Then he went into the city. She came to her mother-in-law, who said, how did things go with you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. He gave me these six measures of barley, for he said, do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle this matter today. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin, of whom Boaz had spoken, came passing by. So Boaz said, Come over, friend. Sit down here. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the, county, uh, the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. So I thought that I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. I will redeem it. The day that you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. Oh, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. Acquire it for yourself. He took off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Chilion and Mahon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Mahon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred. 
and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into the house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ethiopia and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Pisa, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be your restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and lay him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, The son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse the father of David. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron. Hezron of Ram. Ram of Aminadab. Aminadab of Nashon. Nashon of Salmon. Salmon of Boaz. Boaz of Obed. Obed of Jesse. And Jesse of David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, uh, that was awesome. Um, after we go through the book, I just want to lay a very brief um, after context and also have some minutes because we have some time, have some minutes for all of us to chip in and interject. Thousands of um, different sermons can be preached and have been preached uh, from the book of Ruth. I do not intend to attempt to give a sermon from the book because I may be biased. Like I said, you can look at it from thousands of angles. Allow me, however, to highlight the main themes in this book. One is faithfulness. We see various levels of faithfulness in the story written in the book of Ruth. We see Ruth being very faithful to her husband and by extension, by extension to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And actually, this faithfulness extends to the whole household of Naomi, or rather the clan which she got married to. Boaz is faithful to Naomi too, and also to the law of God or to God's law. And also he's very faithful to his responsibilities as a kinsman. I mean, he doesn't learn away from his responsibilities. Faithfulness led to kindness, which is an outpouring of love. I mean, we can sense love throughout um, the words. We can sense love flowing throughout the pages of this book. The second theme I want to highlight is honor. We experience a high level of honor between the various actors. There is also very uh, palpable evidence of honor to God's law. Lud's acts of honor followed her 
and spoke for her, even when she was very vulnerable and open to exploitation. Remember, um, Boaz actually agreed to uh, adopt her after he testified that he had heard of how she had taken care uh, of, or rather honored, the mother-in-law, Naomi. Same case with Naomi, and also with Boaz, and all the other participants who um, were first in line, or rather the other participant who was first in line to inherit Ruth. You see, um, when Boaz called him at the city gate, and after the discussion, there was honor. I mean, he did beat out the bush. He just said, yes, I, I cannot handle this. You go ahead uh, with, the, with the inheritance. I mean, a lot of honor throughout the pages and the, uh, and the various uh, verses. Number three is an aspect of care. The various actors cared for each other. And also, God cared for all of them. Ruth's care for Naomi was reciprocated when Boaz cared for her and protected her, maybe from gender-based exploitation. You hear the mother-in-law, Naomi, actually testifying and saying, it would be rather if you go to that field because if you go to any other field, you might end up maybe being um, uh, harassed. You know, in such a setting, you expect uh, the young girls, the young ladies, some of them to be exploited um, by maybe the, the stronger men who are working in those fields. Take, for instance, um, in our current context, where sexual harassment of the weaker gender is so rampant, I mean, all over, especially in uh, as the weaker gender attempts to make lives for themselves. Most of them in a very competitive society, most of them ends up being sexually exploited and so uh, Naomi didn't, or rather Ruth didn't go through this because of the care, uh, you know, the systems of care which were all loud from Naomi and also from the Kingsman um, boards. The fourth theme I want to touch on or highlight on is a theme, the theme of redemption. Boaz in the book actually is termed as the kinsman redeemer, who redeemed a hopeless, vulnerable fallen girl. Bad things maybe could have happened to this girl and also to Naomi being a widow. But the redeemer, Boaz, did not even think of this girl as a foreigner. Didn't, of this, didn't think of this girl as a Moabite, but she thought of this girl as someone who needs to be taken care of. I mean, that brings in the aspects of redemption. And I think that's why the book, actually towards the end, drives, out, drives us to um, the story of David, or rather the genealogy of David, whereby um, Bo uh, the, the, the uh, Boaz is brought, or rather Ruth and Boaz are brought forward as descendants, grandparents to David. Remember in the Gospel of Matthew, both of them are mentioned, Boaz and Ruth. Very few women mentioned in that genealogy, but Ruth is mentioned, Boaz is mentioned, as descendants in line of our savior, Jesus Christ. And so the story of redemption is so evident in these, uh, or rather the theme of redemption is so strong 
in this particular story. So I think those are the four major themes which I, I, I highlighted. I don't want to go into a discussion of them, but since all of us are here and we have gone through the story together, I think we'll, let, we'll use the next few minutes, maybe interjecting, bringing in maybe a new theme, bringing in something uh, maybe to the story to make it more real to all of us. I think- Hi, Zeke. Yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Sue, please. Okay, um, it was so helpful. I had an aha moment uh, and probably everybody knows it, but Isaac, when you were explaining uh, the Moabites and just where they stood, I've never understood that since they were, were not one of the 12, but how beautiful it is that this book more than any others says to us, yes, uh, the, the savior comes from within the 12 tribes of Israel, but look at this addition. It brings in a whole new group of, people, all of us, who are not uh, uh, part of the tribes of Israel, but we're Moabites, basically. That's just, that, that kind of was, was fun for me to think, to hear, to hear. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think, uh, yes, just like you've rightly mentioned, for us who are not Israelites, feel more at home with this story, mm -hmm. feel more, uh, you know, accommodated in the salvific uh, story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The, uh, the story of, you know, of Ruth is also, it seems like a story of Naomi too. You know, she kind of felt like the end was lost or whatever, you know, but how God uses just ordinary people. I mean, she was just, you know, you wouldn't have thought that she was gonna be the great grandfather of David and then ultimately the, Era of line of, of Jesus, but you know, God uses circumstances that we don't understand sometimes to to uh, to, 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 to do things he is in charge and so forth. And sometimes it's easy to sometimes you know feel like, oh, don't call me Naomi, call me Myra, you know, I guess which is a, a, a you know, from a Hebrew word of being bitter and so forth. But uh, how, how God, you know, stay stay faithful and you know. God's in charge. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trent, for that. And that reminds me um, when I was reading through the story, seeing how things were working to the favor of Naomi, I mean, of Ruth continuously, reminds me of, uh, you know, her, 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 her virtue. I mean, she was just a good person cared for the mother-in-law. And definitely, you see the turn of events, things working for him, I mean, for to her favor. And so I think it's uh, uh, building on what you've said, teaches me that um, if I want to position myself in the way of favor, or rather, if I want to position myself in the direction, in favor's way, I have to be there Doing good, I mean, doing good to everybody, even the vulnerable, even those who cannot pay me back. I mean, just by doing that, Ruth found herself in favor's way all through. Hi, Meg. <laughs> Okay, we are waiting for someone else. Any, anyone else wants to interject and bring in, bring in something? You know, the first time I read this, I, we'd all heard about the faithful daughter. The first time I read it, I'm going, wow, is this mother-in-law pimping out her daughter-in-law? They've moved <laughs> to this new place, and now she's sending her to the field for the express purpose of being noticed by somebody who can take care of her and take care of their family and give them a station in life. So you've got all that, but I, but, but that's kind of creepy too. And I guess you have to put that in the context of the day because 
that's kind of what Naomi's doing. She's saying, Ruth, we need to take care of you. You need to, you need to go out and get noticed. And let's hear it for the mother-in-law's plan. It worked like a charm. Yeah, you know, too, though, back, back culturally, you know, she would have been, I mean, Ruth would have been expected to um, be in mourning and so forth. Her, her, her husband had died. And I think Naomi was saying, you know, all right, that's over. Put on, put, put on a good dress, put your makeup on. You're out there. You're, you're available now. Uh, I think that's a very, that's a very important um, um, uh, aspect brought in by Mr. Mr. Brick. And I, um, if you look at it, um, cut or rather in the context, definitely uh, Naomi knew that this girl, good as she is, cannot remain under my fold forever. I mean, she needs to be taken care of. Definitely, there was some discussion. Uh, maybe she could mention to her the possible uh, people, the probable people who can maybe uh, you know, take care of her in terms of inheriting her. You see, um, from my culture where I come from, uh, I remember somewhere I was reading a cultural story which was saying that when women or ladies were old enough for marriage, the mothers used to have some talk with them. And in that talk, at some point they could say, you know, they could suggest um, possible suitors for them. I mean, they could say, you see, uh, us as a family, we admire this family very much. By that, she was not talking about that family, but by extension, she was talking of a certain young man in that family who she thought this is someone who can take good care of my daughter. Definitely, because this was a very cultural setting, this was not in isolation. I mean, Ruth just waking up and going to Naomi's farm was not in isolation. There was some, some, some work being done. But remember, she, he was in line to redeem her. Maybe uh, Ruth, or rather Naomi thought, the other king's man who was in line was not a very good suitor. Maybe she thought, this other guy who is first in line is not very responsible. And so she was like, I would like you to go this direction. I mean, that's how I, lo I would look at it. I think, uh, you know, initially, Ruth goes to the field that she goes to, and that's kind of a God-guided thing. Uh, ultimately, yes, it, Boaz is the choice. Uh, he's not the oldest. So uh, this other relative was in line. And this, this goes along with the Levitical marriage of you know when jesus is challenged about you know if, if this man dies and then the brother takes his widow as his wife and doesn't leave a son then he dies and the next one and the next, who who is the husband in in heaven and jesus addresses that this is for sure a cultural thing and if you want to see a, a current movie about a levitical marriage in in portrayed in our world today, it's the Hallmark movie, Loving Leah, which shows exactly the man taking off his, his sandal and, and, you know, tossing it when, when this is supposed to happen and he's not willing. Um, it's, it's a real interesting concept that still continues today. And I think it's important that we know that in the Jewish world today, reading the book of Ruth always happens on the night, uh, the beginning of uh, what we call uh, Pentecost, which they call, of course, Shavuot. And it's interesting that they study the book of Ruth all night long. 
and we go, why, why would they do that when it's, it's uh, the celebration of the giving of the Torah? And it's because they have this concept of healing the world, of redeeming the world. And Ruth is the example of that, that God works through that hopefulness and that faithfulness and that healing that he brings and that that is the calling of the Jewish people even today, that they feel their role is tikkum olam, that bringing the world together in healing and unity and goodness and that all of that is portrayed in Ruth. And I, I think Ruth is a really exciting book, um, especially when we understand all the background and the relationship with the Moabites and, and the undercurrent of everything that's going on. So anyway, that's, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And we missed your insight last Sunday. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Dave, you want to say something? No, I, I let Meg talk today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, right. watch, watch uh, Loving Leah. It's a wonderful, wonderful, touching movie. And it's so much fun to watch it all played out in modern day terms that this can still happen in orthodox families today and then when they butt up against the modern world how how does that work out so it's, it's what, what was the name of that movie loving leah it's a hallmark movie sometimes you can get it at the salt cellar sometimes in one of the hallmark stores but it's it's a real fine movie of a young a young woman who loses her orthodox husband and and his brother is a physician, is a doctor who, who is a secular uh, a Jew, and he has no understanding of what this is that's descending on his head, that he's supposed to marry his, his former sister-in-law, and how she has to move into the world of being more cultural and uh, uh, less orthodox. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful movie and a wonderful ending but it, it really shows that Jewish side of trying to maintain the lines of the brother's name and the brother's property. And we, we kind of forget that, yeah. Uh, Blake is right. Naomi was kind of pimping out his, his daughter-in-law, her daughter-in-law, but um, in a kind, gentle way. Oh, and the other thing is when, when she, she cover when she uncovers his feet to lay under it that was really a forward thing to do because that was kind of viewed hopefully we don't have children listening as a, a kind of uncovering the family jewels as it were and and once she did that that was really a forward proposal of saying i'm here and and i'm yours if you want me in a culture that just didn't do that. So uh, Ruth was being very brave to do that and that uncovering really would have kind of been his prayer shawl that he would have been sleeping under and with. And we, we don't understand that because we don't look through Jewish eyes. So it's pretty cool. Two, two the, it's kind of hard for us to relate to the whole matchmaker uh, thing in society, you know, that. You had had the matchmakers that kind of took care of you. Hey, you need to get with so and so, whatever. So you know, in our culture, you know, no, nobody's gonna. I'll do that on my own. I don't need need a matchmaker. But that was that was the way it was. I have to laugh as a mother of three daughters. There's quite a bit behind the scene matchmaking, unbeknownst to our daughters, as they mature and right. and pick out their mate. <laughs> That's why I, I had to chuckle as I was preparing to be Naomi. I thought, right on. <laughs> and I have three wonderful sons-in-law. <laughs> Good. Um, anyone, anyone else with something to say? Uh, I just wanted to add a, a, a little bit about how I personally connect with the story. Um, Meg, I love that movie, uh, Loving Leia. 
And, um, but to the side, when I was, when I was a little girl, uh, I love to read Ruth and Esther over and over again. And I think, you know, from in my little girl mind, they were very romantic stories. They were uh, like church fairy tales. So I would see Aladdin on Friday night, and then I would go to church and talk about Ruth on Sunday. Um, but at this point in my life, I'm so moved by Naomi and Ruth's relationship. And that's what I really, um, that's what I really experience in my own life now is, is the way that my relationships with women have helped me um, take care of myself, uh, make life choices, um, grow closer to God, um, and just really the yeah there's there's something there i think about the strength and power of women in community with each other and women looking out for each other and that's just been a really profound experience in my life and so that's that's what i really love about this story thank you thank you um I paused just to check if we have uh, any other um, any other interjection, and if we don't have, um, Mr. Trent, would you like to thank the cast? <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, the uh, you know part part of it was just uh, hey, I knew some certain 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 people. I definitely wanted to ask for that that would that are perfect, and I think they all worked out really well. Um, I, I did the, um, y'all were very willing to do it and, uh, I thought it was kind of, kind of a fun, fun thing to do. I, I, and I thank you all for, for all, all you doing that. Thank you. Uh, we also thank you for, uh, coming up with that and all the, the work you've done to, you know, to, to bring the cast together and, uh, you know, you've made it happen and we, we also thank you for that. So I believe um, maybe after we get uh, reactions, uh, we'll see whether this is the way to go or maybe we'll continue this way, but maybe we gonna, we got to wait for reactions. Otherwise, thank you so much, all of you. Anne has not spoken, so, and the one who has not spoken uh, does the final <laughs> prayer for us. <laughs> Anne? Yes. Dear Lord, thank you for this big scriptural reading formed by God. Thanks for the care and the faith and all those things which help us see how relationships can can flourish. Thank you for the cast. Thank you for Isaac's introduction, which made it more clear. I totally enjoyed this. Thank you very much, dear Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a blessed week. You yeah. too. Thank you. Good. <laughs> now, how do we get out of this? <laughs>